move on, it's another red flag for China's banking system here. And what we're looking at is the credit to GDP gap. Now, this is the difference between the credit to GDP ratio and the long term trend. And it's put together by the Bank of International Settlements in Basel. And the number for the first quarter hit 30.1%. To put that in context, BIS says anything above 10% suggests risks to the banking sector. We've got a chart that shows this pickup. And it's much higher, that 30.1%, than 40 other nations and the euro area. And really, BIS saying that a number uh, of this size, 30.1%, suggests that there is a possibility of a banking crisis that is now looming for China, Yvonne. threat to the global economy right now. Ken Rajoff telling the BBC the country's economy is slowing down much more than official figures show. He also thinks China is going through a, quote, big political revolution. He says the country's push to tackle corruption and transform its economy could be led by consumers. Rajoff says China is dealing with a debt problem after credit-supported growth. Following years of triple-digit growth, the IMF expects China's GDP to grow by 6.6% this year. The bottom line, Ken Rajoff worries about China. You know, so much has been said and written about the great Chinese economic slowdown. We knew it was coming. So it became about adjusting outlooks and expectations, both for China and for the rest of the world. But there are growing concerns the world's second largest economy is headed for a major crisis, not because of the slowdown, but because of debt. That's our focus this week, the risk of a banking crisis in China, where years of building and spending sprees have led to mounting debt. Steve Chow starts us off with this report from Shenfu. In the heart of the city of Shenfu is a circle of life, a 60-story, $16 million structure meant to attract tourists. The only problem, Shenfu is a ghost town. Its emptiness has come to symbolize all that's gone wrong with the country's economy. This is what we call a rotten building. It's unfinished because they ran out of funding. What's more alarming is that there are now hundreds of deserted cities like this throughout China. According to the government, China has more than 2 billion square meters of empty residential space. That's enough to house more than 100 million people. These empty shelves have in many ways become symbols of a wild spending spree that some say has gone on far too long. Economists say a mountain of debt is rising faster than the economy can grow. Our government indeed interfered in some unnecessary things. An extraordinary admission, but China's premier still denies the economy's in trouble. We are fully confident of China's long-term economic growth. As long as we continue to reform and open up, China's economy will not suffer a hard landing. Because according to the Bank for International Settlements, the debt alarm just keeps ringing louder for China. We're going to discuss that now with Sebastian Malier. He's with the Economist Intelligence Unit's global forecasting team in Singapore. Sebastian, the idea of debt in China, I think it actually has been around for a while, but it's been, I think, maybe overshadowed um, by the economic slowdown. Now that we've reached the point where the slowdown is, is very real, it seems 
And correct me if I'm wrong, we should really be taking more notice of these potential banking problems. It's definitely a concern at the moment, and it's becoming a growing concern. And one thing that particularly grabbed the headlines recently was no particular development in China, but actually a data release by the Bank of International Settlements, um, a global financial watchdog. And in its quarterly data release, what the BIS has said is that one indicator of a, bank, of a potential banking crisis, which is called the debt-to-GDP gap, a measure which looks at the debt-to-GDP debt ratio and compares it to its long-term long -term trends. Well, that measure for China has hit 30 a measure of 30.1 in the first quarter of 2016, compared with about 24 a year earlier. And the BIS says that when a country has a measure of about 10, it is at high risk of a banking crisis over the next three years. Brilliant. Of course, there's a lot of concern about the level of bad loans and that the level is in fact higher than the official number, which is around 1.75%. Some analysts say it could be closer to 20%. And we know that in uh, the first, the second quarter, non-performing loans increased by 6.8 billion US dollars. This is a very um, simple final question, Sebastian, but I still, I still want to ask it. I want you to tell our viewers about the potential global impact here, because we already know what has happened with China's, as I keep saying, economic slowdown, the so-called managed slowdown and the knock-on effect of that. But if there are further banking and debt problems like we're talking about, how is that going to affect everyone else? The key issue here is that China is, by some measures, the biggest economy in the world. And it's very well integrated in global supply chains. So anything that happens in China will have repercussions globally. Um, there are some, some um, restrictions on how financial problems can, can be transmitted abroad because of the, some, the restrictions on the flows of capital outside of China. But um, if we have some sort of reckoning in the financial sector, there will be a transmission towards China's real economy. And as we've seen, even with the January jitters, this kind of transmission can have an impact on all um, economies that export to China, so commodity exporters to, from the Middle East to Africa to Asia and Latin America, which are dependent on China's demand, would suffer. Um, and you would also see an impact on um, Western economies, either through a trade channel, through a confidence channel, which could hit um, global stock exchanges. Um, so, so, so you could have different channels, but, but no uh, single economy in the world would really be spared if we had a major um, crisis in China. Mm. Sebastian Malia from the Economist Intelligence Unit in Singapore, we thank you very much indeed for your time this week.